you in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Before we go there, it's our practice here at Harvest. We like to go right through the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. We're currently in the book of Acts. Last week we were in Acts chapter 20, and I want to remind us of something that Paul said to the elders there at the church of Ephesus. In other words, we had a peek into a wonderful pastor's conference. We did. And the greatest pastor of all, aside from Jesus, is probably, G is probably the Apostle Paul. And so we peeked in, and one of the things he said was this. You ready, Chris? He said this in Acts chapter 20. Go ahead. He said, Therefore, I testify to you this day, elders of Ephesus, that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. What is whole counsel? Most people will say, well, that's, you know, teach the hard stuff as well as the easy stuff. Yes, but it goes deeper. Are you ready? Go ahead, Chris. What about Nehemiah 8.8, 8, which I believe is in the heart of the Apostle Paul? Here's what Nehemiah said. And the Levites, the priests, if you will, the pastors, helped the people to understand the law. So they read distinctly. Last week we saw that Hebrew word was parash, and it means meticulously dispense. Read distinctively, word for word, from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the readings, manners and customs and histories. We would call that expositional teaching. And then I also believe Paul had this verse in mind, Isaiah 28 verse 10. Whom will he teach knowledge, and whom will he make to understand the message? For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, and line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. I believe that the Apostle Paul, when he said the whole council, he would say in our terms, verse by verse. If you didn't know, the chapter and verses weren't inserted into your Bibles until about the 1500s. So Paul wouldn't have said verse by verse because he really didn't have that concept. He said it as close to our understanding as we could be. Teach your Bible. I have taught your Bible, in his case, from Genesis to Micah, verse by verse. Unfortunately, I believe that too many churches, that's really not their methodology. I mean, I get it. Can you, Pastor, give us, you know, little topics and series about 10 ways to do this and five ways to do that? That's how I like it. I like it digested for me. A kind of a pablum form, please. The Bible says very, very clearly, you've got to know him by knowing his word. Amen? To grow in Jesus, you must know Jesus. Sounds like a bumper sticker, I know. Want to grow in Jesus? Well, you got to know Jesus. And the best way to know Jesus is know his love letter he sent you. Line upon line, chapter by chapter, and book by book. Are you sure? <coughs> Are you sure that's what he meant? Are you here in 2 Timothy chapter 3? You know, Timothy traveled with Paul much of his life. 2 Timothy is the very last correspondence that Paul is ever going to write anywhere, anyone. He's going to be dead in a matter of weeks, perhaps months. If it's the most important thing that you want to leave with someone, what would it be? Notice what Paul says to Timothy. 2 Timothy 3, look at verse 16. All scripture. If you want, you can circle scripture and then write in the margin. That's the Greek word. Now, Remember, we're reading English translations of what Paul would have written. He would have written in Greek. So English word is scripture. That word in the Greek, what he actually wrote, is graphe. Graphe. It's where we're going to get our word graphite. What do we put in pencils? Black graphite. All scripture, graphe, written word. I want to say that again. The written word of God is what's inspired, Harvest. Not always what pastor says about it. Are you okay with that? The word, the word, the word. Praise God for people who teach God's word. 
But remember, it is the graphe, the written word that is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, knowing what is right. For reproof, <clears throat> knowing what is wrong. And I, I don't know, maybe it's my perception, but even in the church, the church itself can't seem to have the message, don't do certain things. We don't want to offend the tithing units, <laughs> pardon me, the parishioners. So let's tell them all the good stuff. Doctrine, you got to know what's right, Harvest. Reproof, you got to know what's wrong. And correction, and how to get out of your addictions at all. For instruction in righteousness. Now, why is that important? Verse 17. So that the man or woman of God may be, say it with me, complete. Interesting word in Greek, holokleros. All my bits and pieces, all of my parts. Maybe I've got some parts of my mind in a good spot. Got a good sense of direction. No blind spots. How many of us have a blind spot? You better raise your head. Because we all got them. Even those blind spots, if we let God's supernatural word convict us, he'll take care of those too. That's what that means. Holocleros, all your parts, thoroughly equipped for most good's works. Every good work, amen? All right, Harvest, look out. Here comes some Bible for you. Are you ready? Whole counsel of God. I want to let you guys know that I'm a history geek nerd. I am. If my glasses could have tape on them, they would. I am Poindexter personified. I'm Poindexter in tennis shoes. Why? I happen to believe that ancient moniker, those that do not learn their history are destined to repeat it. Also, too, the Bible says... God says to you, I want you to love me with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Uh, when I first became a Christian, I was a college student, and I thought it was all of that and an intellectual bag of chips. I really did. I got it wired. Can't tell me nothing. Any of you 19-year-olds remember those days? You know, uh, as my father got older and older and I got older and older, uh, I found out he was smarter and smarter. When you're 19, your parents don't know nothing, including double negatives. They don't know nothing, can't tell me anything. When I was in school in college and I was presented with a gospel, immediately the cluck of the tongue, oh gosh. You guys, you Christians are so dumb. That Bobby, you can't trust it. Somebody invited me and they said, how do you know that? Uh, heard it once from a professor read it a bunch of times here and there. And I'll, I'll never forget the young man who at the student union between bites of pizza, they did have pizza in the 1980s. I just want to let you know. <laughs> How do you know? You looked for yourself? I took that as a challenge. Come to find out, did you know that your Bible has some very satisfying intellectual foundations. Are you ready to take a deep dive? Not a deep dive, actually. For me to really do this, it would take several weeks, but I won't. We're going to hit the high spots. Are you ready? Let's go ahead and go to our next slide. The written scriptures are supernatural. The written word is supernatural. Pastors' comments and stories and series of, of uh, topical messages, not always. Thoroughly equipped against sin, relentless demonic activity, depression, suicide, and addictions. Psalm, or I should say, uh, graphe. You know who wrote the very first pages of scripture? God did. Now that looks like Moses, a little like Charlton Heston, but not really. Um, that's, of course, an artist's rendition of Moses. Who wrote the first graphe of God's word? He did. He did. Did you know that in Exodus 31, verse 18, and four other places, says that the commandments were given to Moses on Mount Sinai, and they were written by God's finger. Now think with me. If you know you have a, a crucial bit of information to get to the humans, fully anticipating hostile jamming, 
you'd better come up with a system that, oh, I don't know, let's call it, has a very broad bandwidth. Any computer nerds out there? You, the broader the bandwidth of broadcast, the harder it is for an enemy to jam it or to corrupt it. So God's bandwidth is eventually going to be 66 books. For instance, go to the Bible and tear out the section on baptism. There's not one, there's how many. Old Testament, New Testament, models and teachings and so on. The very first graphe is God, and he's going to promise us something. I will take care of it. Are you ready, Chris? Look at Psalm 12. Well, don't turn there. It'll be up on the screen. Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words. You, notice capital Y, that's God himself. You, God yourself, shall keep them. Strong word in Hebrew, to guard. O Lord, you shall preserve them from this generation and forever. How long is forever? You mean just until the, the liberals get a hold of it and tweak it and make it say something not right? No. I'm going to show you today that God has taken tender care of his Bible. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, the raiders lose. But the word of our God stands, say it with me, forever. Psalm 138, verse 2. For you have magnified your word above all your name. How important is God's graphe, his written word, to him? Most important. What's the process? Well, like Moses, men were specifically chosen and prepared. Got some more verses. Ready? Jeremiah 1, verse 5. God says to Jeremiah, before I formed you, Jerry, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I sanctified you, meaning I set you apart. Psalm 139 says that he knit all of us together in our mother's womb. He knit our physiology to be exactly what he wanted. He knitted our intellectual abilities, grasp and reach exactly as he wanted he also knit within our abilities aptitudes. Some of us are good at numbers, and some of us are good at eating. Amen. Sanctified. He especially, I'm thinking of Matthew. Matthew made a living. Well, first of all, he ducked out of his parents. His surname is Levi. He is a Levitical priest. He knew he was a man of letters, and he was really good at letters, and he became a tax collector. You remember that story, right? Well, what's that? That's the guy that collected your taxes and everybody hated him for it. He developed what's called a kind of a koine or, or, or a, um, what's the term, a shorthand for Greek. In other words, if you're going to have people coming traipsing through your tax booth, you better have a quick hand. And he did. That's why Matthew, when he is saved, you come with me, says Jesus. God used Matthew's quick hand hand at shorthand and that's why in the book of Matthew you have entire teachings of Jesus verbatim does that make sense some of us are good with wrenches and mechanics etc etc whatever God has made you to do and to be he made some people specific to write down God's scriptures I sanctified you Jeremiah and I ordained you as a prophet to the nations Galatians 1 verse 15 it pleased God, says Paul, who separated me from my mother's womb, Psalm 139, and called me through his grace. Then these guys wrote it down as, as it was on their heart. It wasn't like automatic writing, whoa, my hand is moving all by itself. No, they sat down and they wrote. But in the case of these 66 books, the original autographs, when they were done, every word was exactly what God wanted. Jesus would say every dotting of the I and crossing of the T. Now here's the challenge. The original autographs <clears throat> contain zero errors. The name of the game is can we copy those in, well, before we had Xerox machines. In fact, is Xerox even a company anymore? We have copy machines. In fact, we have our phones now, chiki, chiki, and we'll get that. Here's what God set the Bible apart more than any other book ever. He watched over the transmission of this, and I'll show you here in a minute. And finally, 2 Peter 1, verse 20 and 21. 
Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is by any private interpretation. Harvest, you've got to hear me on this one. When you go and sit down in a Bible study and the leader says, we read a section of Scripture, then he looks at you and says, okay, now, what does that mean to you? According to this Scripture, whatever it means to me is what it means to me, but it is not potentially accurate. Are you okay with that? It's of no private interpretation. We've got to get the words right. We've got to get our Greek dictionary, our Hebrew dictionary, Aramaic dictionary, and now you can get those online, and you've got to get the words right. You've got to get the history correct, the manners and the customs. You've got to know what they were saying. Please understand this. Every scripture has one correct interpretation. Now, here's the fun part. If you get the correct interpretation down, then the Holy Spirit brings what John Corson likes to say, application of that truth. Does that make sense? Many of the time, uh, someone will come up after a message and they'll say, you know, Pastor Steve, when uh, you were reading the verse and then you said, and then they'll quote something that I didn't say, that really spoke to my heart. I'm all, thank you. Now, what happened there was a spiritual truth because your Bible is living and active. The graphite touched their heart. Then the Holy Spirit brought an application to their personal circumstance. That's how it works. One more time. Knowing this first harvest, no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nope. For prophecy never came by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. All right. Here comes your nerd alert. Are you ready? Where did Moses get all, for instance, the, the uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? He got it from Wikipedia. Let's check a look. Go ahead, if you would, Chris. Or leave my glasses on. There we go. All right. This is Genesis chapter 5 and Genesis chapter 11. If you read them on the page, you'll start with Adam, and he lived so many years, and then he had Seth, and then he lived so many years after that and died after this. And as you read uh, chapter 5 of, Galatia, of uh, Genesis, and then the story picks up in Genesis 11, by the time you get to Moses at the bottom right hand of the slide, that's 25 generations. So Moses is giving us the Genesis story of Adam and Eve, right? There he is. 25 generations removed? I don't think so. Now watch this. I've laid it out for you in this fashion because when it's laid out this way, notice a few things, would you? You notice number one, go ahead, that Lamech, Noah's father, knew Adam for 60 Five years. Follow me on this one. What do families do when families get together? Well, they eat. And what is another thing they do? They tell stories. So Adam was telling his son Seth and then Enosh and so on. And by the time Lamech is there, Adam is still alive. Next, Shem, who makes it through the flood and lives 500 years after the flood, please notice, Shem outlives Abraham by 33 years. Next, Jochebed's grandfather Jacob knew Shem. And Shem heard the, the stories from his father and so on. He knew um, Jacob knew Shem for 60 years. And then finally, so Moses learned the creation story from mom, if you will, just four generations removed from Adam and eyewitness. How many of you have never heard it sort of put quite like that? And when you go to college, um, usually right around the spring semester, I'll get some phone calls from students who are now in college in their freshman year. And they came here and have been at Harvest for some time. And often, because they have to take Western Civ, Western Civilization, they got to take that. They're going to be introduced to something called the Plates of Gilgamesh. 
And typically the professor, whether at Turkey Meadows or UNR, takes great joy in saying, <laughs> Gilgamesh plates are older than Moses. Moses wrote about 1500 B.C., and Gilgamesh predates him. And did you know where Moses got the flood story? From Gilgamesh. Bang, you know, intellectual mic drop, they think. Did you know that every, everybody say every, every continent. Thank you for the passion on this side of the room. Every continent in that continent, there are hundreds of flood stories. Here's the point. Gilgamesh's and his plates are no different. Here's the difference. Gilgamesh heard his flood story from whoever and however he did. Moses heard the flood story not from Gilgamesh. He heard them from the transmission I just told you about. Who had the more accurate story and details of the flood? Gilgamesh or Moses? Moses did. Oh, and by the way, Moses goes up on the mountain with God, Mount Sinai, for 80 days. So if there were any edits that needed to be made, Moses had the basic story down already. And he got the specifics from God himself. What was he doing up there 80 days? We can only assume Part of my hunch is, is he was also writing down the histories, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Actually, that wouldn't be true, would it? He would write all the histories of, of uh, Genesis and the creation story, and then later after Mount Sinai, they take off, and then Moses will fill in book of Exodus, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All right. Now, the canon. What is the canon? You may hear this term. Why are these 66 books in and some of them are not? Go ahead to our next slide. 66 books, 929 chapters, 31,102 verses. How come these and no others? Every once in a while you'll hear, you know, we, have, we found some lost books of the Bible in Yarrington. We did, we found them there. And uh, if you pay us $29.95, we'll send you a copy. Um, even the Bible itself will mention certain books that we don't have access to. Well, what's up with those books? Does God lose anything? Never. The lost books are not consistent. The term, the understanding of lost books of the Bible, is not consistent with the character of an all-knowing God. I'm going to show you the Dead Sea Scrolls here in just a minute, and you're going to find out that God has taken very good care. Please understand that the 27 books of the New Testament, they were pretty much decided by the time John, who lived a very long life, by the time he dies. Hey, John, I got this a gospel according to Judas flying around. Is it right? Let me take a look at it. What could John say? No, because he was there. You're going to hear sometimes something called the Council of Nicaea, this Summer of 325 A.D., that's when all those eggheads actually picked all the books of the Bible. No, more on that in a moment. Canon, it comes from the Greek word to read, to measure, a standard of measurement. The Old Testament is the story of a nation that would bring forth a Savior. The New Testament is the story of that man, Jesus Jesus as God and Messiah was validated by Jesus fulfilling over 300 specific prophecies. J. Barton Payne's Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy says he believed that there's over 8,362 of those verses, of all the verses of the Bible, are prophetic. 300 specifically about Jesus. My hunch is, I have a hunch that most of the verses are prophetic in the Old Testament. Why? Because Jesus says that the entire book, meaning the Old Testament, speaks of me. But there are some startling specifics. Go ahead, Chris. I'm going to show you some probabilities here. The probability of fulfilling just eight Bible prophecies by random. For instance, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, your Messiah is not going to be born in Denver, Colorado. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. So pick your birth. That would be rough. So we're going to call it one chance at 100,000. 
Zechariah 9, verse 9. He would ride into Jerusalem one day when it was time to, for him to take the throne on a donkey. That's not hard. So we'll give that a one chance in 100. Zechariah 11, verse 12. He's going to be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. 500 years before Jesus was born. Was Jesus betrayed for 30 pieces of silver? That's going to be one in 1,000. Zechariah 13 Money would go to buy a potter's field, which it did. That's one in 100,000. Isaiah 53, verse 7, would make no defense at his death trial. Who's going to say nothing against a bunch of trumped-up charges? Well, one guy did, so we're going to call that one in 1,000. Isaiah 53, 9, he's going to die with the wicked but be buried with the rich. That's one in 1,000. Let's go to Psalm 22. He's going to be crucified. Did you know crucifixion was not even invented until 700 or so B.C.? Psalm 22 is a psalm of David. A thousand years. My hands and my feet are pierced. Check that out in Psalm 22. The rolling dice for my clothes. That's an easily known story in the Gospels. But when um, Psalm 22 wrote it, that was a thousand years before Jesus was born. Psalm 22 is a videotape of Golgotha and the day that Jesus died, if you didn't know. We're going to call that one in 10,000. What about all eight of them fulfilled at random? Go ahead. That's one chance, one chance in 10 with 28 zeros. Now, I'm no mathematician, but I'm going to say that's right in the area of impossibility. That's only eight, you guys. How many prophecies total? More than 300. Please understand something, that Jesus Christ is like no other factual figure of history ever. Where he would be born, who he would be born to, what he would do. 300 prophecies. And yet there are still people that say, hmm, I think I need some more information about Jesus. Now it's going to get uh, really exciting for you history nerds. Are you ready, Michael? Let's go, Chris. Important texts. Go ahead. This is an artist's rendition of something that we call the Pentateuch. That's your Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the other books, of course, and there are others, um, they are, how are they transmitted? Most often they were copied. If you didn't know, ancient Greek, and, pardon me, ancient Hebrew and ancient Greek, before cardinal numbers of 0, 1, 2, 3, most of the ancient languages used their letters for their numerals, Roman numerals. This is going to be Super Bowl XXZVCIILMNS. I don't know what it's going to be. But those are Roman numerals, right? The Hebrews, when they would write, they had a corresponding numerical value. How would they know if they were getting every word correct? You didn't say C. Dick Run and then write C. Dick Run on your new copy. You went S, S, E, E, and so on. And when I got done with the new um, sentence, I could add up all of my numerical equivalents of those, of those letters. And if my sum at the end is the same as this sum, did I get all the letters correct? When I get done with the page, then I can add them vertically as well and get a number at the bottom column. And then if my number at the bottom right hand of the page is exactly as the one I just copied, how many letters have I misplaced? None. In Greek and certainly in Hebrew, that's how the Old Testament was copied. Not, not just thought for thought, but letter for letter. And those existed, uh, sometimes they were transmitted orally. So when you read the book of Isaiah, you'll notice that your text looks like it's almost in the form of a poem. Because very often, all those 66 chapters were memorized. So sometimes you had an oral transmission, but oftentimes it was written down. And those written, those written scrolls were called targums. And the whole sort of Old Testament collection was called the Tanakh. The modern Tanakh that Jews use to this day was compiled soon after the return from Babylon. Who wrote the first letters? God did. 
Moses copied them down, and then they copied them in the manner I just described for the next uh, probably uh, 1,400 years. Now, we don't have any of those old uh, copies, but I'm going to show you some that are pretty close. Um, when they come back from the Babylonian captivity, they're back in Jerusalem. They're all, you know what? We'd better get all of our Old Testament books in a canon, or basically, this is our Bible. And so there was something called the Great Assembly, or the Great Synagogue, and present were the prophets Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, and it is said, 120 elders of Israel. And they put it all together. Those are some of the first Tanakhs, or a collection of their Bible. The oldest surviving fragments of any Jewish Tanakh are claimed to be from a guy, well, this guy here, Mr. Haircut. Look at this guy. Yeah, he looks good, doesn't he? That's Emperor <clears throat> Severus Alexander. Severus Alexander, in 222 to 236 uh, uh, AD, he was the honcho in Rome, and he whips out something that is later referred to as the Severus Scroll. And he said it was taken by Titus, who sacked Jerusalem in 70 AD. It is said that Titus got some scrolls together before he eradicated all of the temple and most of Jerusalem. And it was in the sort of treasure trove of the emperors until Mr. Severus Alexander, 150 years later, gives it, or gives this Targum, gives this Tanakh to Jews because they were building a Jewish synagogue there in Rome. This is also very important. This, go ahead. This is called the Septuagint. This is very important. LXX is the Roman numeral for 70. Why 70? Because that's how many scholars were given the task. Real quickly, Rome, uh, I should say, uh, Babylon comes and goes, then the Medo-Persians come and go, and then here come the Greeks and Mr. Alexander the Great. About 336 to 323 B.C., Alexander captures most of the region. Now the Greeks are in charge. And so the Greeks, they wanted copies of the Old Testament. So in 285 to 270 B.C. in Alexandria, Egypt, uh, there is a Greek translation made of the Old Testament. And it's commissioned by a fellow by the name of Ptolemy Philadelphus, who founded the Philadelphia Eagles, I'm pretty sure. I don't think so. But the point of it is, he goes, let's have us an Old Testament in Greek. Now, this is why that's important, including the book of Daniel, meaning some of the most startling prophecies in the Bible are in the book of Daniel. And Daniel is in existence in the Greek language 300 B.C. Why? Because especially Daniel chapter 11, which is going to talk about the inter inter between the Testaments. Inter I can't think of the word. Between intertemestables, <laughs> between Malachi, uh, uh, last book of the Bible, and Matthew, there's a 400 year and some say gap where God was silent. Oh, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Daniel chapter 11 gives us a practical blow by blow of exactly what's going to happen, right down to the Maccabees. And that is also in Greek. A uh, hundred years before the Maccabees did what they did in Hanukkah and all that. So the LXX, or the Septuagint, becomes the Old Testament Bible of the New Testament church. Um, the Council of Nicaea that I mentioned earlier, if a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door, they try to dazzle you with pseudo-scholarship. Do you know about the Council of Nicaea, 320, 325 B.C.? And when they come to your door, you usually got coffee stains on your T-shirt and you barely put on pants. You're like, what? And they try to tell you, well, that's when they put that Bible together and it's all crazy. Some people say it was the Council of Nicaea that dreamed up the doctrine of the rapture. They don't know their, they don't know their history. Council of Nicaea was commissioned by a fellow by the name of Constantine. What did they do there? They put a stamp on, what do we really believe? They put a stamp on the 27 books of the New Testament that were already acknowledged as canon. Very important. Now, some of you have a Roman Catholic background. That's an important thing, the Council of Nicaea, because you learned by rote 
the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed. That's where all that came from. They didn't really dream up anything. They put a stamp on what was already happening. And where is Nicaea? It's in Turkey. Why? I'll show you in a minute. So the Septuagint, now you know what that is. It's B.C., before the New Testament. Now this is important. The Masoretic text, M.T. Go ahead. M.T. If you have a Bible right now, very likely, in fact, you're in 2 Timothy, well, even the New King James, you'll often will see M.T. this and M.T. that because of the M.T. This is what they're speaking of, the Masoretic text. What's that? Around 90 A.D., remember the Romans kicked out the Jews out of Rome in 70 A.D. So years after that, around 90 A.D., something called the Council of Yamnia, and it convened to finalize the Old Testament canon. They already knew what their Old Testament books were, and um, they had their um, they had all of their targums and what have you, and their Tanakhs. But they wanted to make sure because we are going to be scattered throughout all of the earth, and they were after 70 AD. Let's really and really and truly finalize it. So after the, the Council of Yamnia, that council rejected the LXX as a Christian Old Testament. We don't like those guys, so no way. And then they actively destroyed competing Targums or Tanakhs. And that's when they inserted vows and word breaks. If you read um, uh, Hebrew, you'll notice that you'll see breaks between the words. When Moses wrote and when Isaiah wrote and some of those Old Testament guys, there were no breaks between the words. Now you get to the 7th and 8th centuries. Schools of Jewish Tanakh scholars were called Masoretes. It looked really good on your letterman's jacket. You had a big M there for Masoretes. Worked, they often worked in the Galilee and some in Jerusalem. They began to unify the books of the Tanakh. Now the oldest partial manuscript of the Tanakh available is this one. Go ahead. Got a picture of it. Go ahead. That is the Aleppo Codex, or copy one I should say. And it is dated to 925 A.D. And then there's one that's um, also pretty old. It's this one. Go ahead. Codex Leningradinus. Three guesses where they found this one. In Germany. And there's a little part about that, but that's 1000 a. AD. Um, and your English translation, by the way, of the Old Testament comes mostly from the collection of the Masoretic texts. A lot of them still survive. All right. Now we're going to get into the Roman period. Are you ready? Let's put on our Roman uh, brush head, headdress. A.D. 14, Augustus Caesar consolidates all of Roman's power. For the next 300 years, Rome persecutes the church. Remember the Christians in the lion's den? They hated the church. Rome was pagan. They borrowed much of their uh, pantheon from the Greeks until, then the, until many of them began to get saved. Then around 313 A.D., a fellow by the name of Emperor Constantine He's got to mix it up with Maxenius at the Melvian Bridge. Who's going to rule Rome? And it's a toss-up. We don't know who's going to win. Constantine says to the Christians, I saw a vision. Really? I looked in the sun and there was a shield. And on the shield was a cross. And I heard a voice in this sign conquer. I heard God speak and he said, I'm supposed to be a Christian like you guys. Okay. Is Constantine truly saved? I don't know. He had some pretty scary episodes in his life. But here's the point. He then issues in 330 AD, he issues the Edict of Milan or Edict of Tolerance. And he says, hey, Rome, stop killing the Christians. Then you can get a job working for the government. Is that a good job? And so Christians begin to work for the government, and by the time you get to 380 A.D., Emperor Theodosius I makes Christianity the official religion of Rome. And that's where Western civilization takes a turn for the religious side. And that's going to eventuate into some pretty wacky church stuff going on. By the way, did you know that Jesus prophesied this entire process? 
It's the church of Thyatira. Check it out. If you ever want to get our messages on it, you're going to find out that God knew the Roman Catholic Church was going to get rolling. In fact, the Nicene Creed, we believe in this and that, and that the, we believe in the Catholic Church. That Nicene, key, that Nicene Creed was developed before the Roman Catholic Church because Catholic means universal. The Roman Catholic Church is going to get rolling right around 590 as we know it, and then it's going to be in existence as it is today. Anyway, now Rome says... We want a Bible in our language. And what language did they speak? Latin. And that's when you're going to get, go ahead, this. The Latin Vulgate. And there's your Latin right there. Can you read that? I know, it's all Greek to me. So in 390 to 400 A.D., Jerome is commissioned by Pope Damasus I. All right. Is everybody okay? Anybody need a Gatorade? Now I'm going to show you this. Are you ready? Go ahead. Here's our map of Israel. Uh, there are the, are the current nations around. There's Jordan and Egypt and Syria and what have you. Can you see the two bodies of water? Uh, the Sea of Galilee or Tiberias to the north and then the Dead Sea to the south. Very important. Hit the go button. Let's zoom in. So there it is. And you see where Jerusalem is today. Um, that's important because... Uh, in 70 A.D., the Romans destroy Jerusalem, and about 900 of the upper echelon of the Jews there in Jerusalem escape with their lives, barely. 900 of them race south along the Dead Sea's western shore, and toward the bottom, the very bottom of the Dead Sea, there are some book cliffs, and there was a big old castle that was built by uh, King Herod. 900 Jews from Jerusalem escape the net of the Romans and they hurry down and they whisk past a, a monastery of monastic Jews at a place called Qumran. Go ahead. Qumran is right there. Now why is that important? When they race through the Jewish scholars at Qumran in 71 and 2 AD, where are you going? We're running from the Romans, and here they come. Really? So the Essenes, who were the monastic Jews there in Qumran, they went, oh, no. They're going to roll right through us. And they did. But before the Romans got there, these Essenes took all of their Bibles and correspondence, and they went up into the cliffs, and they buried them there. Go ahead. This is what's left of the Essene monastic uh, village that is on the north shore, northwestern shore of the Dead Sea. Can you see the Dead Sea up in the upper left-hand column? And uh, these stones were unearthed relatively recently. You'll see as you're looking south, that's where those 900 Jews were hightailing it to Masada with the Romans right on their tail. They had just enough time, did all of these scholars, to pack up all their stuff and to hide them in the hills. I hit the go button. Here's an artist's rendition of what that might have looked like. Yeah, pretty cool. You can go and visit that if you'd like someday. Take a lot of water because it's hot and dry. Hit the go button, Chris. See up there, G? Uh, go ahead again. That's these series of, of uh, cliffs and and doors. You'll see there, kind of in the bottom uh, third, there's a door right there. That's a cave. They found many, many caves. Well, about 1947, before Israel as a nation, some Bedouin kids, and nothing, hit a go button. I think I got another shot of it. Here's looking up. Um, many of the caves are not up those precipitous type uh, cliffs. And there are others that are lower down. One of them was called Cave Number 4. What happened in 1947, kids are playing around, doing what they shouldn't be doing, and they're throwing rocks. They throw a rock to the back of one of these caves, and they hear shattering pottery. They go in, and they find out a bunch of leather all rolled up. They tuck several under their arms, tell their dad about it, and their dad says, I think this could be important. So he takes it to some people who knew some people who knew some people, and somebody said, where did this kid get it? 
Oh, down there by that old Essene monastery ruins. Ding! They knew the story. And they never knew what happened to all of the Essene scrolls. What had that kid found? He found them. Hit her, go, button. So there's the jar, the Dead Sea Scrolls, 1947, and then, of course, the War of Independence, 1948, rages. They're eventually able to go back, and they spend a lot of time, and up until, I think, recently, they've been still discovering stuff. But in 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls are discovered, 11 caves, 600 manuscripts, 200 of them were Bibles. 80% of them were leather, 15% uh, papyrus. The leather hung out for a long time. God is, it's like God was saying, I'm going to keep my Bible in a nice, dry, no humidity, sealed in a jar, because the humans, at the very last days, many of them are going to say, you can't trust that Bible. Oh, yeah? How about I unearth 2,500-year-old Bibles? That's what the Dead Sea Scrolls is. In cave number four, 400 manuscripts. Many were written before 300 B.C. In other words, in 70 A.D., they were hundreds of years old then. 40,000 fragments and every book of the Old Testament is represented except Esther. Here's the most important thing. It predates the fall of Jerusalem, including Daniel chapter 11. I think I have a picture of the Isaiah scroll. Go ahead. If you go to Israel, you can look at this in the museum. That's called the Isaiah scroll. It's 24 feet long. It's 2,300 at the least, maybe older. 2,300 years old. Now, if you read a hit or go button, um, let me zoom in on it a little bit. That's what it looks like. You're looking at leather that's 2,300 years old that God hid from all of the humans for all that time. Now, why do I say that? If you were to turn to this section in your book of Isaiah, it would be practically word for word correct. The Isaiah that you hold in your lap, compared to the Isaiah scroll, potentially 2,500 years old, is less than 1% difference. How good did the scholars of Israel take care of your Old Testament? Got some comparisons for you. Um, we got to do this now. We're going to move quickly. So oof, we're running out of time. Go ahead to our next slide, if you would, Chris. Well, here's what happens. In 330 AD, Rome splits. There you have Rome there. Hit the go button. Constantine says, I'm out of here. Man, there's a uh, lot of stuff going on, uh, corruption, etc. He picks up and he moves the capital of Rome to Constantinople. Uh, that's in modern-day Turkey. Rome East is eventually called the Byzantine Empire. It's going to last for a 1,000 years. What happens in the West? Around 410 A.D., the Visigoths overrun Rome, and then you, Rome is under new management about every couple hundred years. And boy, do they get weird. 600 to the 1600s, Europe is gripped by something called... Go ahead, Chris. Oh, there's Israel at the bottom. Go ahead. There's Israel. Now hit our go button. Dun, 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 the dark ages. Why? Because now the Western church has been terribly corrupted. It's awful. And Europe is thrown into the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages or medieval Europe. That's what happens in the West. And when you look at the atrocities of Christians, you're going to find out they were no Christians. They were people that wore a Christian name badge, but they had political motives to be sure. It gets rough in the West. What's going on in the East? Glad you asked. Go ahead. Oh, good stuff. There's your Byzantine Empire. That's what's going on in the East. Um, the East flourishes. And from about 500 to 1453 A.D., Eastern Orthodoxy really does quite well. That's going to eventuate into Russian Orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy, um, the uh, Orthodox Greek church, etc. That's what happens. Now, here's why that's important. So for a thousand years, they began to collect Bibles. Next slide, please. Somebody started gathering all those together and to something that's called the Texas Receptus. 
The end of the third century AD, Lucian of Antioch, that's Turkey, compiles Greek texts that become the standard throughout the Byzantine world. They took care of their Bibles. In the West, not so much. So by the 16th and 14th century, the majority of your New Testament texts were available. They were produced in Byzantium or Constantinople. Then in 1525, Erasmus, using five or six Byzantine manuscripts, compiles the first Greek text on a printing press. Hold on, I'm telling you, this is going to be important in a minute. These and more become the basis of the oldest copies of the New Testament. It's called the Textus Receptus. Think of it as a big pile of New Testaments. Then, in, go ahead for our next slide, in 1611, the King James Bible comes up. So James VI of Scotland becomes king of England. 1607, he assembles 50 scholars through prayerful committees. By this time, the Textus Receptus had collected 5,005 complete New Testaments, Matthew to Revelation. And it was completed in 1611. King James Version is heralded as the, quote, noblest uh, monument to English prose. Very important, too, when it is uh, translated, it is translated uh, word by word. Remember uh, Graffe? Those scholars transliterated every word as it was. Your newer translations don't do that. They go thought for thought. More on that in a moment. All right, now what about manuscript evidence? Go ahead. Where did your history books come from? They come from older history books. Now here's what I want you to see, a comparison. For instance, Pliny, he wrote approximately 61 to 113 A.D., do we have any of his around? Yeah, we got seven copies. And the oldest, there's an 850 year gap. But historically, that ain't bad. Plato, earliest is 900 AD. That's a gap of 1,200 years. We got seven of those laying around Caesar, Aristotle, and even the Iliad by Homer. The earliest copy is about um, uh, 400, earliest. Written about 900 B.C., pardon me, earliest copy is 400, and then that's a gap of 500 years, and you put all those old copies, you get 643 copies. So that's not bad. So when you go to college and you take Western Civ or any other history, much of what you're getting in your history books is coming from these and books like them. Please notice, no original autographs, huge gaps of time from the original to when the first copy shows up. And then there's not many of those copies laying around. Here's the point. Historians say, that ain't bad. You can believe it. In fact, look on Wikipedia. It's all there too. Can I give you a comparison? Go ahead. The New Testament, written approximately 55, thereabouts, front and back. The earliest copy we have, you guys, is dated to 60 A.D., and many of those copies of those 5,686 copies date to within the lifetime of the eyewitnesses. Does that make anybody go, golly? In other words, you get a copy of your New Testament, you read about the accounts that went on there in Jerusalem. For a very long time, you could take your Bible to Jerusalem. And ask somebody, hey, that resurrection of Jesus thing, did that really happen? Some kid will go, yeah, my uncle Lenny was there. He, here's his address. Go ask him. Does that make sense? No other work of iniquity, of antiquity has that. Hit the go button one more time. And we have portions of 25,000. Going quickly now, next button. Here's some of the oldest we have. It's called the Magdalene Papyri. This is dated to within 60 A.D., and um, Dr. Richard Thede, for the longest time, suspected that it was an actual autograph. He took those uh, papyri, he put them on their side, put them under an electron microscope, and identified more than 20 layers. He could find out what kind of stylus was used and what angle it was used at, and if the author was right-handed or left-handed. For the longest time, he was convinced that that was the original. Could have been. But now he's backed up a bit and said, well, maybe not. 
Let's go quickly. And then we're going to get to the Alexandrian Codexes, which is, means books. The great city of Alexandria, there it is, had a legendary library. It started about 285 B.C. and was built out over 400,000 books. Rolls, really. Most of them were burned down in 888 B.C. by Caesar, Julius Caesar, and then ultimately was completely destroyed by the order of Caliph Omar, 64 A.D., the point of it is, in Alexandria, Egypt, there were lots of Jews and lots of Christians, and they had lots of Bibles. Um, here's some of the old ones that come from there. Here we go. Go ahead. 1630, a codex is bound like a book from Alexandria, Egypt, is brought to England. One of the three oldest manuscripts of the whole New Testament ever found. 200 years later, Codex Sidianicus, a complete New Testament, is discovered in an old monastery on Mount Sinai. Wow. It dates back to the 4th century A.D. Mid-1800s, the Vatican finally let scholars look at the New Testament codex that they'd been there since 1481, Codex Vaticanus. They may be the oldest, but here's the point, Harvest. There are significant differences between the oldest three oldest codexes called the Alexandrian codexes from the Texas Receptus. Now, why is that? Have you heard people say, King James only? And they look down at you if you have a King James. It's because of some of this nonsense. And about the 1850s, the higher critics come along. Go ahead. They start with uh, mostly in Germany because that's where the, the, uh, the, the brightest thinkers were thought to be. Seminary students begin to compare Bible texts with other Bible texts. And they begin to notice, hey, those first 39 chapters of Isaiah they seem to be different from chapters 40 to 66. We know because Isaiah was written by two different dudes. And they got an A on their thesis and then a degree in their pocket. Well, everybody else began to say, hey, good idea. And they began to, higher critics begin to say, well, look how the book of Genesis lays out. That couldn't have been written by Moses. Going back to uh, what's called the Deutero-Isaiah theory, can I put that to rest for you? John 12, verses 38 and 41, Jesus quotes from the first part of the book of Isaiah, and so Isaiah wrote that, and then quotes from the second half of Isaiah, and Jesus said that Isaiah wrote that. To you higher critics, Jesus said Isaiah wrote first and second half. Did you know that Jesus also quotes from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy and every time he does, he says, Moses wrote them. So, you higher critics, if you don't believe that Jesus knew what he was talking about, you might have bigger problems than who wrote the book of Isaiah. The, in the footnotes of many of your Bibles, you're going to see something, N-U. What is that? It's because of these guys. Go ahead. We got this guy, Mr. Eberhard Nestle. He's from Stuttgart, Germany. He's one of the higher critics. He published a critical Greek New Testament called the, go ahead, Novum Testantium Graciae. I don't know what that means. But what it is, it's the Greek New Testament. 28 editions later, this is the basis for most English New Testament translation. And the later editions were helped by this guy. Go ahead. Mr. Captain Kirkelon. He's from Munster, Germany. And the latest editions are referred to as the Nessel. Alon Greek New Testament, N, and United Bible Societies, U. Here's the point. You're going to see in your Bible a number of places where they say, you know, the best translations don't have that in your Bible. And if you've ever come across that, you went, I thought I had a good Bible. You need to know something. Mr. Nessel and Mr. Alon are higher critics. And they borrow mostly from the Alexandrian codexes. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were found and they put together all of the books of the Bible, all the New Testament, the Dead Sea Scrolls were 70% the same as the Textus Receptus pile. The newer translations like the NIV, etc., are from the Alexandrian codexes. Chuck Missler says this. Go ahead. Go ahead on our next slide. Oh, by the way, well, where did Mr. Nessalong get it from? From these old geezers. Who were they? That's Mr. B.F. Westcott. 
and that's Mr. F.J.A. Hort. Let me tell you about these guys. Go ahead. Next slide. Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort, there's a mouthful, were Anglican churchmen. They were Church of England guys who had contempt for the Textus Receptus. They began to work in 1853. And that resulted in 28 years, after 28 years in a Greek New Testament based on the corrupt Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. You guys know what that is now. Both were influenced by Origen, largely considered a heretic, and others, were den and others who denied the deity of Jesus Christ and embraced the prevalent Gnostic heresies, that's the first heresy of the church, the Council of Nicaea was convened to refute it. That's why in the gospel, or I should say the letter of John, John says, Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, we felt him. I think the Gnostic heresy was already taking, rate, taking its place. John says, the Gnostics say Jesus was here, but he wasn't really human. And when he walked on the beach, he didn't leave any footprints. <sighs> John, no, we touched him. Origen was, was greatly influenced, and where do you suppose Mr. Origen et al. were from? Alexandria. There, there are over 3,000 contradictions in the, four, in the four Gospels alone between these Alexandrian manuscripts and their traditional Greek texts in 8,413 places. You guys okay? Can I go a little bit longer? Is everybody all right? Anybody need a stretch or a Gatorade? Go to the next one. I want to tell you about Mr. Hort and Mr. Scott. 1845, Westcott and Hort founded the Hermes Club. Hermes is the Greek mythology, was a messenger of the gods and guided departed souls to Hades. 1851, they started a guild called the Fraternal Group at Cambridge, uh, Cambridge there in Great Britain, to, quote, conduct serious and earnest inquiry into the nature of supernatural phenomenon. Are you supposed to be messing with supernatural phenomenon, especially the occultic flavor? No. There is your Westcott and Hort. B.F. Westcott, go ahead, next one. In a letter to the Archbishop of Canterbury, Westcott wrote, no, no one now, I suppose, hold that the first three chapters of Genesis, for example, give a literary history. That's not how God really created things. I could never understand how anyone reading them with open eyes could think they did. How many of you would disagree with Mr. Westcott? J. A. Horton, April 3rd, 1860, go ahead, wrote, but the book which has engaged me most is Darwin, published in 1859. What may be thought of it, it is a book that one is proud to be a contemporary with. My feeling is strong that the theory is unanswerable. Excuse me? Go ahead next. Also, Mr. Hort writes to Westcott, I have been persuaded. Go ahead. Oh, there we are. Thank you, Chris. I have been persuaded for many years that Mary worship and Jesus worship have very much in common and their causes and results. The pure Romish view seems to be nearer and more likely to lead to the truth than the evangelical. Oh, and by the way, purgatory is a great important truth. How many of you would disagree with Mr. Hort? Why is that important? Because when you read in your Bible and you read at the bottom, there's an asterisk. If you have an NIV, you get to mark the last chapter and you get right about to verse number nine. All of that remaining text is in italics if you have an NIV. Why is it in italics? Asterisk, bottom of the page. The NU, Westcott and Hort, say the best ones don't have these in them. They're disregarding the Receptus and they're saying, we like those Alexandrian codexes. So, whenever you see the best translations or quote the most reliable translations, you'll see at the bottom, NU and Westcott. And if you'll pardon me, baloney. And why is that important? Because if you've ever saw that, you mean I'm not reading the best part of the Bible? Historically speaking, if you have a King James or a New King James, you are fine. Your copies come from the receptive side, the Byzantine side. Word for word or thought for thought? Go ahead. Here is a quick rundown of some of the more... Oh, I was going to say, 
Um, used to be you had to go to years of college to read Greek and Hebrew. <laughs> Not anymore. Download blueletterbible.org or esword.com, and they can show you how to look up the meanings of the Hebrew and Greek words yourself. Um, here's a quick glance. Here's our last slide. I promise that we were get through it. There's a quick glance. It'll be available on the website. There is kind of a rundown of some of the, the uh, English translations. 1382 was the first English uh, Bible translated from the Vulgate, but that's Middle English. You'd have a hard time reading that. Geneva Bible in 1560, uh, that's what the pilgrims had with them. Douay Rhymes, and you get to King James, 1611. Please understand, it's a word-for-word -word transliteration. You have Rise Standard, New English, Jerusalem, and then you have the New American Standard, 1971. It is a thought for thought. It's not a direct transliteration. Living Bible, great uh, Bible, but it is not a translation. It is a paraphrase. New International Version, 1978. It is a thought for thought translation. I have issues with the New International Version. And then the New King James in 1982, which we read from here at Harvest. It's the same as the word for word translation of the 1611 from the Textus Receptus group. But they just uh, change the thous and the frowards and the comest thou hither and frowards into modern English. It is still a word for word transliteration. Then you have the New Jerusalem, the New Revised, and then you get to that thing called the message. Oi! The message is not a translation. What did I say? It is a highly idiomatic paraphrase. You did it, Harvest! There's where you got your Bibles. Let's all stand. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the patience of this crowd, Lord. Some would call it tedium. Some would say, if I wanted class, I'd go to school for crying out loud. Thy word, O oh Lord, have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin. Jesus himself said that the words that I speak to you, the graphe, written and preserved, the words that I speak to you are spirit and life not topical messages. Not a steady diet of them anyway. Harvest, would you join me in prayer? My wife prayed this morning, and it was so powerful, and it really is absolutely right on the button. Where's our revival? Say many. And then in their minds, a videotape plays what they think revival looks like. Well, it's kind of like a big party. Everybody's Christian now, Christian like we like. Everybody's singing with passion, and the churches are packed. That's not the revival of actual history. The real revival started with one person totally repenting of sin. And then that singular heart infected, inflamed the heart of someone else who then was convicted of their sin. No more excuses. No more justifications. God's word says A, B, C, and my life is very different from that. Conviction harvest. Conviction of sin is how someone gets saved. Not a grip, big group of people with loud thumping music and a ranting person at the front. I don't know if there's another Revival scheduled for America. I sure hope there is because, boy, are we in big trouble. And, Lord Jesus, we will continue to pray for revival. But, Lord, may it be revival as your word, your graphe, all the way back from Sinai has said it. Harvest, do you want a revival? Let it start with you. Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. One more time. Matthew, this week, chapter 5, 6, and 7. Read it. Meditate upon the graphe. Not a topical series of 10 ways of a better marriage, 15 ways for more finances. The graphe. Scripture is going to be able to equip you 
to do what is right, to know what is wrong, and to overcome and enlighten the blind spots in your life, if you'll let it. Lord Jesus, would you pour out through your Bible this week, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, because here am I, Lord. Send me. In Jesus' name, I know everybody said, amen. amen. Woo! Pick up your uh, Masters of Divinity on the table on the way out. God bless you, Harvest. We'll see you on Tuesday. Praise.